علماء اسکالرز تھنکرز ڈگریٹریز اینڈ مائی برادرز اینڈ سسٹرز ان اسلام اینڈ مائی سنز اینڈ ڈاٹرز الحمد للہ تعالی آئی تھینک اللہ دا المائٹی ہو پروائیڈڈ اس with this great and beautiful occasion to celebrate the launch of the manifest Quran. very humble work and service to translate the words and meanings of Allah's book and communicate its message to the people and particularly <coughs> to the Muslims especially the younger generations of the Western world I praise Almighty Allah again that with His Tawfiq and ability which he has conferred upon us. We are sitting here together in a very large number. To listen and understand some important things and aspects related to this translation of the Holy Quran known as the Manifest Quran. <coughs> First of all, I would like to congratulate all of my sons and daughters who were involved in its typing, typesetting, formatting, reviewing, proofreading and printing after I had translated it. I congratulate all of them and especially my son Khalid Tahseen who <coughs> Tahseen Khalid has put a remarkable and unprecedented efforts and endeavors in getting it printed and providing it in the fixed time from Istanbul, from England and from different printers altogether. and Waqas Amin, Bilal Hussain, Shaheeb Hussain and my office assistant Basir Ahmed. I am congratul congratulating them again including Farooq Rana and his colleagues 
in Farid Millat Research Institute, Minhajul Quran headquarters, Lahore, because all of them were involved in the process of its final production. <clears throat> Not too much time is left, so I would like to embark upon the main subject without going into the preliminary details. I would like to name it. I would like to say a few words about the characteristics of Quran regarding translation, about the history of Quranic translation. <clears throat> about the science of Quranic translation, about some challenges which a translator faces while translating Quran to other languages. And finally, about some salient features and unique characteristics of the manifest Quran. As far as the Quranic characteristics regarding its translation. I would say that the Holy Quran has two qualities. One is that the Quran is untranslatable. And second is that Quran is translation friendly. <clears throat> These are two different characteristics which we find together in one book. It is untranslatable and it is translation friendly. The reason why is it untranslatable is that the Quran is Allah's speech, not human speech. And being Allah's speech, it is Allah's attribute. And Allah's attribute is not creation, like Allah Himself. It is non-creation. Allah's speech is non-creation. That's why it is untranslatable by the hands of any creation. Many translations were produced over the centuries, but no translation can ever hope to capture even a flash of its splendor. It was not possible. <coughs> As far as it's being translation friendly, the other aspect. Reason for is, this is that this book was revealed as guidance for humankind. This book was revealed by Almighty Allah to show the right path 
to humanity. So guiding humanity and showing the right path to them needs understandability. It needs intelligibility. Only then its message can be communicated to the communities, cultures, peoples, nations of the time, for all times to come. That's why it was made translation friendly for us. We should keep in our minds that Quran, the Quran, is the greatest of all gifts ever blessed upon us from the presence of Almighty Allah. <clears throat> it is the living book of life and it addresses itself to the living. It is stated in Surah 36, verse 69 and 70. This is just a reminder and a manifest Quran. This is Allah's statement. So that anyone who is alive may be warned, may receive guidance from it. So only the living humans and alive can receive the proper guidance from this source. Quran says in its own words that it is light. The Quran is light. It means that Quran is self-manifesting. Quran does not need any external agent to make it visible and manifest. It is manifest in itself. Stated in Surah 5, Al-Ma'idha, verse 16. Almighty Allah says, with it, by the means of Quran, Allah guides those who pursue his player to the ways of peace and brings them out from darkness into light by his will and guides them to a straight path. <coughs> so along with all these attributes, characteristics and qualities of Holy Quran, the most important feature is its literary excellence. In spite of being a divine source of guidance, the reason, as I have already mentioned, is that it is a scripture meant for human enlightenment. And enlightenment relates to the most urgent and vital questions which have deep concern to every human being. And every human being is deeply concerned to those questions, to the answers of those questions. Quran is the only book which answers such questions as lie beyond the purview of human finding. Quran answers the question who we are, what we are, 
where we have come from, where do we stand in this world, what is our relation with the other existences of this world, where do we go, where we have to go from here, what is the truth of our life in this world, whether we will get another life after death, whether there would be another life hereafter or not, would we be answerable to someone or not? If no, then what is the purpose of creation and living of human being? And if yes, then to whom we would be answerable? And so on and so forth. There are so many questions. Answering them human beings are totally unable to understand the relevance of their existence. Quran is the only answer to all these questions. Without a clear knowledge of these realities we are lost and we are living as losers regardless of whatever we may imagine be to be our achievements and our success. We are losers. The Quran suggests a spiritual diet and a program of spiritual rehabilitation and self-purification to the youth, to the youth who are languishing on the plane of animal existence, which is captive of materialistic values, and those youth who are rendered spiritually important by sensual pursuits. Quran gives them light, tells them where to walk and enables the human being, all faithful human being, all believing human being to see the facts through the curtains of deceit and disinformation and ignorance. There are facts and realities but hidden behind the curtains curtains of deceit, curtains of disinformation, curtains of ignorance. Quran enables us to see through those curtains. Then Quran states itself, O believers, be conscious of Allah and have faith in His Messenger. He will grant you a double share of His mercy and give you a light to walk by and forgive you. Similarly, same is the case with communities, with societies, with groups. Those communities who have lost their moral and spiritual bearings. The Quran holds out the great promise of restoration of their spiritual balance in this material world. And moral equilibrium through its high standards of ethics and spirituality. Since these functions are being fulfilled by this book so Almighty Allah has made it translation friendly and since from the time when this great book was revealed in the days of Holy Prophet and in the periods where the companions of Holy Prophet used to live 
the process of translating Quran in different language to different languages had started. Quranic translation is the sunnah of the companions of Holy Prophet. Islam was expanding in different regions and parts of the world. And the people and the communities and societies, they were embracing Islam. Numerous communities and tribes, after embracing Islam, they realized and recognized the importance of comprehending the tenets of Islamic faith. And it was not possible unless the main book that contains this guidance was translated to their native language. So in written form or verbal form, the companions started translating it partly so that the message of Quran and the message of the Holy Prophet وسلم, is rightly conveyed to them, those who were known Arabs. It was absolutely impossible for them to understand a single thing from Islamic teachings unless the same was translated to them in their native language. The first example of the process of Quranic translation which I can trace from authentic books and records is that Sayyidina Salman Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu he was asked by the people of his origin, original country and his language to translate Surah Al-Fatiha for them and certain parts of Quran for them. So Hazrat Salman Al-Farsi translated Surah Al-Fatiha to Persian language for them. This is mentioned by Imam As-Sarakhsi in the famous book of Hanafi Fiqh Al-Mabsud. And Burhanuddin, Imam Burhanuddin Fi Al-Muhit Al-Burhani in his book. Then there are many other traces because of the constraints of time I would not like to mention these but in the first two or three centuries the Holy Quran was partly translated in different languages for the people where Islam was reaching the translation of Quran was also reaching along with it it was translated in Syriac language that was the language of ancient Syria it was translated in Berber language, the Morocco, the Berber language. Then it was translated partly in Persian language. And it was in 2255 Hijra. It was translated in Indian language. And it was translated in Kashmiri language. The Raja of Kashmir at that time, his name was Marukh. And his governor of Sindh, it was, Sindh was under him. His name was Abdullah bin Umar bin Abdul Aziz bin Al Munzir. Not Umar bin Abdul Aziz the Caliph, no, somebody else. So this Umar bin Abdul Aziz translated the Holy Quran for the Raja of Kashmir in Kashmiri language up till Surah Yasin 
this can be marked the first ever translation of the Quran in any language of Indo-Pak subcontinent. But it is not available now. Then the scholars, a team of scholars from Bukhara, Balkh, and Fargana, they jointly translated the Quran for the Samanid ruler Abu Saleh Mansur bin Noh. It was in 961 to 9, uh, 961 to 976. It means around 11 to 1200 years before, and 348 to 364 Hijra. Normally, it is said, but not proved that the full translation. Persian, first Persian translation available, it is published. That was produced by Sheikh Saadi Ashirazi in 14th century, I mean six, seven hundred years before. It is published always, it is available, but it is not proved through authentic records. Clearly it is the translation produced by Sheikh Saadi Ashirazi. But the first translation in Persian, in Indo-Pak subcontinent, in Persian language, which is authentically established and proved, was produced by Shah Waliullah Muhaddis ad -Dilavi. In 1737-38, around 300 years before, that was in Persian. It is available and it is proved, authentically proved. Then first Urdu translation was produced by his son, Shah Rafiuddin. This was first ever world for world Urdu translation. World for world. Then his second son, Shah Abdul Qadir, actually was his third son. He produced another Quranic translation Urdu, in Urdu language and that was first ever idiomatic Urdu translation. Ba Muhavara, idiomatic Urdu translation. Easy to read, easy to understand, easy to communicate the message. This was the case of Indo-Pak subcontinent. Persian and Urdu translations. In the same way, the first Turkish Quranic translations were produced in 11th century, 900 years before. It is not available now. But the translation, Turkish translation, which is available, was produced in 1333, around 700 years before. It was translated in Eastern Turkish language. It is considered to be the oldest translation in Turkish language. And there are some other references regarding Turkish translations too. Now I want to come to European translations of the Quran. The first translation of the Holy Quran produced in any of European languages was the Greek translation. And in Greek language this Quran, whole Quran -e Majid was translated and it was produced 1100 years before. It was done by Robert of Caton. Then this translation was revised by Theodore Bibliander and it was published again in 1543. This was a revised edition. Second European 
a second Quranic translation in European language was produced in Spanish language. In 1844, it was published in Madrid, Sambia. Then third translation was produced in Italian language. It was published in 1547. Fourth Quranic translation was published in German language in Europe in 1616. And this German translation became the basis of first Dutch translation. Later on, in 1641, the Quran Majid Quranic translation in Dutch language was published, but Dutch translation was based on German text of translation. Then from this Dutch translation, the first French translation was produced. French. It was in 1647. And from this French Quranic translation, first English translation was produced. And that was in 1648 or 1649. It was printed in London. And then the second English translation appeared in 1734. George Sale. It was direct translation from Arabic text to English. Then Russian translation appeared in 1790, then Hungarian translation, then Swedish, then Hebrew, then Polish, then Armenian, then Romanian, then Danish, Bulgarian, Finnish, Norway, and many other translations in different European languages went on appearing. This was a short history of Quranic translation in the Muslim world and in European world. I hope this part was interesting for you. And quite interesting. <laughs> now I will come to the subject of kinds of translation. What is translation? And how many kinds are there? Kinds of translation. Generally speaking, the field of translation can be divided into three types. Three types. The first type is intralingual translation. Intralingual translation. The second is interlingual translation. Interlingual translation. The third is intersemiotic translation. And this can be known as transmutation. Intralingual translation is just rewording of something within the same language. So the all exegetical works, tafasir, they are based on this idea of intralingual translation. It was developed in the form of tafsir, the science of tafsir. All Arab mufassirin, aimma, they translated the Holy Quran and interpreted it with their commentary. Second type which it is concerned to us, which we are talking about, that is interlingual translation. It, it is known as proper translation because it comprises the interpretation of the verbal signs of one language by the means of verbal signs of other language. 
as we understand the meaning of translation. And then intersemiotic translation or transmutation. It means transference of a message from one kind of symbols or one kind of symbolic system to another kind of symbolic system. This is a translation from one symbolic system to other symbolic systems, from symptoms to symptoms of language, linguistic symptoms. Our subject is related to interlingual translation, translating Holy Quran from its source text, source language, Arabic, to other languages. This interlingual translation in general can be further divided into two broad categories. The first is translation which aims at translation which aims at formal equivalence. The second is translation which aims at dynamic or functional equivalence. By formal equivalence I mean that translation will attempt to reproduce the formal elements of the source text to other language, including grammatical units along with the consistency of word usage, reproducing meanings in terms of the source context. In this case, this kind of translation does not need too many adjustments in idioms. Rather, it reproduces such expressions more or less literally. This is a literal translation and for this kind of translation, the term world by world or world for world is used world for world translation. So our main concern is not with this. It is with the second category and that is dynamic and functional equivalence translation. And it is defined to be the closest natural equivalent to the message of the source language. This approach has an advantage, the functional equivalence, over the first one and it is better suited to meet the goal of discourse or the goal of communication, easily understandable, easily intelligible, intelligible. Now this category, this second form, the dynamic or functional equivalence translation is further divided into two categories, two kinds. Do you understand step by step? It can be divided into further two kinds. One is known as thematic translation. Other is known as phrase by phrase translation. Thematic and phrase by phrase. Problem? हो गया फिर पहला हिस्सा खराब हो गया पहला रिकॉर्डिंग में ये ख्याल पहले क्यों नहीं आया वो मेरे अन्ना ये भी एक तीसरी कैटेगरी ऑफ ट्रांसलेशन है इतनी देर गुजर जाने के बाद ख्याल आया कि साउंड ठीक नहीं जा रही रिकॉर्डिंग सो द फर्स्ट केस which I said, thematic translation. It needs or it aims at just easy and natural form of expression in a target language. Just the translator needs an easy way, a very natural form of expression 
to make it more understandable, easily intelligible. In order to achieve this objective, the translator is compelled to make changes and adjustments of various kinds to produce a stylistically satisfactory equivalent. So he makes many adjustments and changes to produce a stylistic, stylistic language, an easy expression, to create an easy communication to the reader in the target language. For this purpose, he knows, all the translators know, that intelligibility, clarity, and naturalness of expression is his primary focus, is his major need. For that, he makes many changes. And among these adjustments and changes are making grammatical changes. A translator who has chosen the way of thematic translation, he would make grammatical changes such as change of tense, change of aspect, change of voice, change of person, number, substitution of nouns by verbs, and substitution of verbs by nouns, and making obligatory omissions and additions. And he will make explicit what is implicit, and he will make implicit what was explicit in the original source. At times, these things involve adjustments of idioms and syntactical changes. Just in order to create an ease for the reader, in order to create a natural expression, in order to create a flow in the language, in order to increase the level of its intelligibility, and in order to connect his translation to the reader. So his target is the reader of the target language. So he accepts lots of changes and adjustments for this sake. The unique characteristic of the manifest Quran is to, to convey the real theme, real message, real meanings, it is unavoidable, these kind of changes and adjustments are unavoidable for them. But the unique characteristics of the manifest Quran is that manifest Quran has tried to avoid all these changes as much as possible while maintaining its clarity, flow, intelligibility and naturalness of expression. Since I am talking about the challenges for a translator, let me explain a little more. The translator is always under a constant pressure from the conflict between form and meaning, or a conflict between the words and theme or message. He has to prefer one of these two. He has to choose. If he attempts to approximate the stylistic qualities of the original text of the Quran, he is likely to sacrifice much of the meaning. And if he tries strictly to maintain the literal content and meaning of every single word, it usually results in considerable loss of the stylistic flavor. He can't combine the both. 
Do you understand the first challenge? The second, similarly the translator is caught in the dilemma of the letter and the spirit. Whether he should maintain the letter or he should prefer maintaining the spirit over letter. If he concentrates too much upon trying to reproduce the original feeling and tone of the message, then he may be accused of playing loose with the substance of the document in the target language. Another problem faced by the translator is proper understanding of his own role. What his own role is. For example, he should know is translating for example an art or a skill which can easily be acquired through practice. Those who have taken translation as an art or as a skill have failed to comply with the obvious principles and procedures which govern the functioning of translation true fun of true translation functioning of true translation similarly they can't appreciate the linguistic grammatical and structural sensitivity which is an indispensable ingredient in any first rate translation these things are sacrificed the another important thing is that translation translator should know also the range of subject matter what matter is being discussed in this verse or this passage it is morality it is law it is theology it is proverb narration exposition conversation he should know secondly he should comprehend the linguistic variety so that he may be able to choose the right words for right expression accordingly. Then he should have a command or good grip on historical depth related to the context of the verse in which context these particular verses were revealed then he should very well know the cultural diversity of the source language and cultural diversity in which the particular verses being translated were revealed. And finally, he should know the conflicting view available in determining the meanings of implication. Conflicting views may be legal, juris, jurisprudential, may be, may be ideological, may be, may be theological, he should know. So the basic principles of translation are proper shifts of world order while translating a verse. Two, maintenance of connectivities between the worlds of a verse or the verses interconnected with a specific background or a specific subject. Three, use of phrases where necessary to trace single, to translate single words in the original. Shifts of metaphors to non-metaphors and vice versa. And careful attention to exegetical accuracy and textual variance. So the translator is bound to understand perfectly the content and intention of the text and the text sender, revealer. Translation should have a perfect and excellent knowledge of the language, the source language from which he is translating and equally sound knowledge of the language into which he is translating. The translator should employ the forms of speech in common usage 
to make it nicely intelligible and attractive for the reader. Through his choice and order of the words, the translator should produce a total overall effect with appropriate tone. So that the target language, the translation, is seemed well connected with the source language, with the text of Quran. And fifth translation should give a just representation of the sense of the original. Whatever is possible. Keeping in mind that basically Quran is untranslatable. But since it is translation friendly, so up to maximum level, a just representation of the sense of original should be given in the translation. And the style and manner of translation should follow the same character, linguistic character, grammatical character, stylistic character, literary character of the original text. These are the basic things regarding the science of translation of the Quran. Now keeping these basic principles and problems and challenges and whatever points I have mentioned, keeping all these in view. Now, let us read some paragraphs of the Quranic translation from the Manifest Quran. I hope there was there was some English speaking person to read these paragraphs instead of a non English speaking person. Hmm. Can Dr. Zahid do it? I am speaking English, but I am not English speaking. <laughs> first paragraph which I have chosen is from Surah Ar-Rahman, verse 46 to verse 78. You will see the verses over there, but I will just read the translation. Just have a taste, delicious taste of the translation. Enjoy it. I am starting from Auz Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Marimun Khafa Maqam Rabbihi Jannatan from here. The one who fears standing before his Lord, there will be two gardens for him. Then which of your Lord's blessings do you both deny? Both will be full of lush green branches. <laughs> Then which of your Lord's blessings do you both deny? In both of them there will be two flowing springs. Then which of your Lord's blessings do you both deny? In both of them there will be two kinds of every fruit. Then which of your Lord's blessings do you both deny? The residents of paradise will be reclining upon couches lined with silky green brocade and the fruits of two gardens will hang low over them then which of your Lord's blessing do you both deny? In them there will be those chaste maidens with modest gazes whom no human has ever touched before nor jinn then which of your Lord's blessing do you both deny? Those <laughs> Those maidens will be beautiful and elegant like rubies and corals. Then which of your Lord's blessing do you both deny? 
can the reward of goodness be anything but goodness? Then which of your Lord blessing do you both deny? Besides these two, these two, there will be two other gardens. Then which of your Lord's blessings do you both deny? Both will be dark green. Then which of your Lord's blessings do you both deny? In both of them there will be two gushing springs. Then which of your Lord's blessings do you both deny? In both of them there will be fruits, date palms and pomegranates. Then which of your Lord's blessings do you both deny? In them all there will be good-natured and beautiful chaste maidens. Then which of your Lord's blessings do you both deny? Wide-eyed maidens secluded in pavilions. Then which of your Lord's blessings do you both deny? Whom no human has never touched before nor jinn. Then which of your Lord's blessings do you both deny? Reclining upon green cushions and magnificent carpets. Then which of your Lord's blessing do you both deny? Blessed is the name of your Lord, the possessor of majesty and honor. <laughs> now, we read some tra translation of some verses from Surah Al-Waqiyah. Surah 56, verse 1 to 40. Is a waqatil waqia. When the inevitable even takes place, none shall deny its occurrence. It will be debasing for the disbelievers, elevating for the believers. You just concentrate on the translation. The verses, things you will recite afterwards. Elevating for the believers when the earth is shaken violently and the mountains are crushed to pieces and they become scattered particles of dust, you will be divided into three groups. The people of the right hand, how happy are the people of the right hand? And the people of the left hand, how miserable are the people of the left hand? And the foremost in faith will be the foremost in paradise. Those are the ones brought near to Allah who will reside in the gardens of bliss. Many of them are from the earlier generations and a few from the later generations. They will be upon couches brocaded with golden embroidery reclining on them facing one another Youths never altering in age will keep going around them with goblets, pitchers and cups full of pure wine from flowing springs which will neither cause them headaches nor will they get intoxicated. They will be served any fruit they choose and the meat of any bird they desire and they will have maiden with beautiful wide eyes like pearls hidden in covers as a reward for what they used to do. There they will not hear any idle or sinful talk except the virtuous word peace, peace. And the people of the right hand, how blessed are the people of the right hand. They will be among thornless lot trees and banana trees clustered with fruits and widely extended shades and ever flowing waters and abundant fruits never out of season nor forbidden and they will be lodged on raised floors with noble spouses indeed we have created these maidens as a unique creation and we made them virgins loving and of matching age for the people of the right hand, there will be a large group of them from the earlier generations and a large group from the later generations. I'm 
reading from Surah Al-Qiyamah. This is number 75, verse 1 to 12. I swear by the day of resurrection, and I swear by the self-blaming soul, does human being think we shall not reassemble his bones? Yes, indeed, we are capable of proportioning even his fingertips. Still human being wants to deny what lies before him. He asks, when is the day of resurrection? So tell them, so when the eyes are dazzled and the moon will be eclipsed, and the sun and the moon are brought together on that day humans will say where is the escape no indeed there shall be no refuge on that day the final abode will be towards your Lord then verse 34 and 40 same surah al qiyamah is such a creator not capable of reviving the dead? It starts from 34. So, woe to you at the time of death. Then woe to you in the grave. Again woe to you on the last day. Then woe to you in hell. Does human being think he will be left aimless without reckoning? Was he not a fertilized egg? Yani a zygote from a drop of seminal fluid? Then he became a clinging mass in the mother's womb. Then he created him in a bodily form with limbs and proportioned him perfectly, producing two genders from this zygote, the male and the female. Is such a creator not capable of reviving the dead? This is a scientific example. <laughs> then Surah Al-Insan, verse 5 to 26. The virtuous will have a pure drink mixed with camphor. Camphor is a spring in paradise from which the servants of Allah will drink. They will make it to gush, they will make it to gush out abundantly and flow like streams wherever they desire. They will fulfill their woes, they fulfill their woes and fear a day whose horror will be widespread. <coughs> and give Okay. And give and give food for his love despite their need for it to the needy, the orphan and the prisoner. We feed you only for the sake of Allah. We do not desire any reward from you, nor thanks. Indeed, we fear from our Lord the day that will make faces look very dark and ugly. <clears throat> So Allah has shielded them from the horror of that day and granted them freshness and radiance upon their faces and happiness in their hearts. He rewarded them for being patient with a garden and garments of silk reclining there upon couches. They will find in it neither the severe heat of the sun nor intense cold. Its shade will be close over them and its clusters of fruit will be made to hang low and silver vessels and shining crystal goblets will be brought around them. These goblets will be made of gleaming crystalline silver which they will apportion in a precise measure. They will be served there with a glass of pure drink mixed with ginger from a spring therein called Sal Salsabil, immortal youths will serve around them 
when you see them you will think they were scattered pearls as you look at paradise you will see bliss in abundance and a great kingdom all around upon them will be garments of fine green silk and rich brocade and they will be adorned with bracelets of silver their lord will give them to drink a most pure drink they will be told this is indeed your reward and your endeavor is well appreciated indeed we have sent down the quran upon you as a peace meal revelation so continue to be patient with your lord's decree and do not listen to any sinner or disbeliever from among them and always celebrate the name of your lord morning and evening and prostrate before him in some part of the night and glorify him by night at length now some verses from surah al mursalat 77 verse 1 to 12 wal mursalat urfan fal asifat asfa by those present winds sent forth successively by those stormy winds blowing violently by those spreading wings scattering rain clouds widely widely by those discerning winds splitting the clouds apart forcefully by the inspirers of the reminder to end excuses or give warnings indeed what you are promised will certainly occur so when the stars are made to lose their light and when the heavens are split apart and when the mountains are blown away like dust and when the time is set for the messenger to witness for what day has all this been set to occur سورہ النازعات سورہ النازعات verse 1 to 9 by the angels who snatch the evil souls violently by the angels who draw out the blessed souls gently and by the angels who float in space swiftly and by the angels who take the lead racing vigorously and then by the angels who manage the affairs of creatures obediently these are five verses one meaning at many places i have given alternative meanings so there are some alternative meanings i have given in footnotes now listen to those meanings a scientific indication can be also be inferred from this verse by the waves of energy that pierce into matter and break up the chemical bonds fiercely by the waves of energy that disintegrate the chemical bonds within matter gently and peacefully by the waves of energy that move around freely in space and within the atmosphere by the waves of energy there surpass other waves in speed force and assimilation by the waves of energy that through mutual dynamism and coordination maintain equilibrium and keep the balance for the survival of the system of the universe now some verse from surah at takwir takwir when the sun is rolled up and darkened when the stars scatter and fall from their galaxies when the mountains are blown away after turning to dust when the pregnant camel camels are left unattended when the wild beasts are assembled together when the seas are set on fire 
when the souls are paired again with their bodies when the female infant buried alive is asked for what sin was she slain when the records of deeds are unfolded when the heavens are stripped away when the hell fire is set ablaze when paradise brought closer then each soul will know what deed it has brought along with it from surah al ghashiya has the news of the overwhelming calamity reached you some faces on that day will be humiliated overstressed and exhausted they will burn in blazing fire and made to drink from a boiling spring they will have no food except a bitter thorny sharab neither nourishing them nor availing them against hunger now some faces on that day will be growing bless blissfully well pleased with their righteous endeavor they will be in magnificent paradise they will they where they will not hear any vain talk in it there is a flowing spring and in it there are raised couches and goblets decently set in place and silken cushions laid in rows and splendid carpets spread out do they not reflect on the camels and so on so forth now the last example from surah ashams by the sun and its morning brightness and by the moon as it follows the sun and by the day as it reveals the sun and by the night as it conceals the sun and by the heavens and the one who built them as a vast universe and by the earth and the one who flung it far from the sun and spread it out and by the soul and the one who fashioned it in perfect proportion then inspired it with the knowledge of its vices and its virtues indeed he will succeed who purifies it and indeed he will fail who corrupts it <laughs> after giving these some examples now <laughs> the real subject which i had prepared the salient features of uh, the manifest quran very little time is left for it so whatever was originally not in the subject i added afterwards so we took the time to give you some, some different samples and examples as i already mentioned that this manifest quran is a combination is actually is a phrase by phrase translation with a very real natural flow and communication of the expression and the message its style this manifest quran is loyal to the world arrangement it is loyal to the linguistic structure it is loyal to the rhythmic flow of the quranic text while it ensures readability intelligibility and ease of comprehension and it involves accurately conveying of the textual meaning of the arabic verses while attempting to retain their unique stylistic elements and grammatical structures <clears throat> every translation of the quran has its own merits and shortcomings the publication of this translation the manifest quran does not by any means imply that other translations have are of no worth no absolutely no astaghfirullah to say all translations have contributed towards the development of the understanding of the quranic message but here are some novel merits in this new translation 
which make it unique among the existing ones. Since time is finishing, I will choose, I will leave some of them and I will choose the sum. First thing was how this phrase by phrase translation has been done. Not a single word of any verse, let me explain this thing. Not a single word and not a single letter, not a single preposition which is contained in any single world in the whole Holy Quran has not been left without being translated. <clears throat> the manifest Quran does not convey just the overall meaning and theme and the message of the particular words. It conveys the overall meaning, it conveys the message, but at the same time it retains the beauty, literal, grammatical, structural, stylistic beauty of every single word of letter of that verse, which has been contained. For example, in <coughs> Surah An-Nisa, It is said, فَإِنْ كَانَ لَهُنَّ وَلَدٌ فَلَكُمْ مُرْرُبْعُ مِنْ وَتَرَكْنَ مِنْ بَعْدِ وَسِيَةٍ يُسِينَ بِهَا أَوْ دَيْنَ The word يُسِينَ بِهَا Most of the times you read the translations like this, missing the meanings or missing the translation of يُسِينَ بِهَا It is said that any bequest <coughs> after the payment of any bequest or debts or after the fulfillment of bequest and debts normally because it creates a flow but the real meaning here is that if they have children then your share is one fourth of what they leave after paying off now is the point any bequest they may have made or any debt any bequest they may have made or any debt this is most of the times in most of the places missed theme is communicated while many words are missed I will give you example of active and passive voices <clears throat> in Surah An-Nisa Surah 4 verse 116 it is stated, in Allah, la yakfiru an yushraka bihi. An yushraka, this word is in passive voice. Mostly it is translated as, Allah will not forgive the worship to others. Allah will not forgive idolatry. Will not forgive associating others with Allah. All these translations convey the message and theme correctly. But the passive voice has been converted and changed to active voice. This was not the structure of Quranic verse. Now the manifest Quran says, indeed Allah does not, indeed Allah does not forgive that any partner be ascribed to him. <clears throat> maximum emphasis has been placed in refutal of shirk that Allah does not forgive that that any partner be ascribed to him so this act this passive voice is most of the time changed to active voice Ki Allah will forgive not forgive idolatry not forgive associating others to Allah in the same way, Surah Al-Ma'idah, <clears throat> verse 115, Almighty Allah says, Sayyidina Sulaiman is saying, Allah says, Fa'inni u'azzibhu, and Almighty Allah says to the people going to hell, Almighty Allah, Inni fa'inni u'azzibhu, azaban la u'azzibhu ahadam min al-alameen. I shall subject to a punishment 
I shall subject him to a punishment I have never inflicted on any other in all the verse. Quran Majid says that I Allah says I will subject him to a punishment that I have Allah says I have never inflicted on any person in the whole world but this place is normally translated like this one that it is rendered into passive voice that he will be punished with a punishment never inflicted to anyone you understand to give the flow active voice that I will punish to him that I have no one ever punished to anyone so it is converted that he will be punished with a punishment which was never inflicted to anyone so the active voice is converted is changed to passive voice at another place in surah Taha verse 39 Quran says Ya khuzuhu adubbun li wa adubbun lahu an enemy of mine and an enemy of his is Musa the Pharaoh shall pick him up from there this is the exact translation of the verse an enemy of mine and an enemy of him will pick him up from there mostly it is translated that he will be taken by an enemy of mine he will be taken becomes passive voice and Quran says in active voice in Quran in Surah Taha verse 70 you know when the magicians fell down in prostration in front of Sayyidina Musa prostrating Almighty Allah when they were defeated in the court of Pharaoh Quran says فَأُلْقِيَ السَّعَرَةُ Sujada Quran says then the magicians were cast down in prostration at other place I have done then the magicians were made to prostrate when the magicians were made to prostrate or were cast down in prostration Ulkiya this is passive voice most of the translations are done that they fell into prostration they fell down in prostration the reason Almighty Allah has used Ulqiyya that they were made to prostrate they were cast down to prostration because Allah Ta'ala there are lot of things the scientific matters, the theological matters, the grammatical matters, the, the legal matters, the matters relating to Kital, relating to the, the non-Muslim, relating to Jizya, relating to the Muslim states' rights, relating to non-Muslim combatants. There are lot many examples which I wanted to give, but I am closing because of Maghrib time. On this point, maybe one example I will like to add only that Almighty Allah wanted to reward them whether they understand the truth or not this is the reason why the passive voice has been used for Sahara'tu. the magicians were made to prostrate this was Allah says in Quran this was not their decision prostrating to Allah were not the decision of magicians they were made to prostrate after being defeated from Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. Why? There is a beautiful reason behind that. Why this happened? Why Almighty Allah made them made them to prostrate? Why Almighty Allah put them? Surah Taha Where was that verse? Bitter Surah uh, yes. Here is the reason in, in Quran. The reason why Almighty Allah made them to prostrate, compelled them to prostrate, because He had decided to reward them. 
he had decided to make them believers to enter them to the ambit of believers and he had decided to forgive them after becoming believers why the reason is when pharaoh called them to combat sayyidina musa and they got together and planned before they started their competition they came to sayyidina musa this is in quran surah taha verse 65 qalu they came to sayyidina musa they didn't start their magic all of a sudden they didn't start their magic on their own no they came to sayyidina musa collectively and spoke to him and quran says qalu ya musa imma an tulqiya wa imma an nakuna awwal man alqa the magician said to musa o oh musa either you should throw first they asked are you going to throw first they asked or should we become the one to throw sidna musa alaihi salam gave them permission saying you should throw first only then they threw their ropes although they were non believers disbelievers but in spite of being disbelievers they had an adab a respect and honor of the greatness of the prophet and messenger of almighty allah <laughs> they had realization that we are not standing in front of someone with a common man we are not confronting a common person this person whom we are going to confront or whom we are trying to defeat is a special messenger of almighty allah in spite of being disbelievers they had this sense in their minds and hearts so this sense of his greatness brought them to sayyidina musa and they were compelled try to understand what i am saying they were compelled to ask sayyidina musa o oh musa are you going to throw your things first or should we start first they were compelled because the greatness and the respect and honor and adab of sayyidina musa alaihi salam was put in their minds and hearts so they asked sayyidina musa his permission then sayyidina musa gave them permission said no rather you should throw first you should throw after getting permission of sayyidina musa alaihi salam they started their magic afterwards they were defeated so almighty allah knew that in the state of being disbelievers they respected my messenger and they asked him gave him the chance if he wanted to throw his things first they asked for permission so almighty allah wanted to reward them when they were defeated so whether they were intending to fall down to prostrate or not allah knows better but and as a reward allah compelled them to fall down in prostration so allah cast them allah cast them to fall into prostration so this was a reward so whole world of the pharaoh was watching the whole story but none of them got this trophy to become believer except those magicians so they said they said for all that's allah said for all qiya sahara to sujada they were not the magicians who prostrated to me no it was me who cast them and made them to prostrate because i decided to reward them because they made an atom of my messenger <laughs> so when we translate it in passive or in active voice that they fell into prostration so the whole phenomena is gone out it was their act allah says it was not their act they were thrown into prostration so these kind of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things alhamdulillah you will find in uh, this manifest quran 
there are textual translations and contextual connotations wherever the matter of qital and qatilu aimat al kufr in surah tauba qatilu aimat al kufr faqatilu so it would be translated normally kill them fight the leaders of kufr fight the leaders of disbelief or kill the leader of disbelief this is although not the responsibility of the translator to explain the theological or historical matters the translator is under a responsibility to translate the words the apparent words and the letters and structure of the verse he is not bound to go in the contextual contextual relevance what was the context behind that what are the connectivities between two three verses what is the overall whole subject being discussed here what are historical references this is not responsibility of a translator to take these things into consideration that's why when a translator just translates the quran he leaves he leaves all contextual relevances all contextual references all historical references all connectivities of verses because this is not his responsibility still he is rightly translating and correctly translating but when just translation of words is done and he the reads he may apply the thing to anything he may become al qaeda man he may become isis man he may become a terrorist and he will read he say quran says wa qatilu aimat al kufr kill these leaders of disbelief fight against the leaders of disbelief this is how our younger generation get misguided they get confused and those who don't belong to muslim community they also use this tool against islam and against quran there is no wrong done by the translator but at the same time since contextual meanings have not been provided in the translation so many misunderstandings can arise this manifest quran has not left a single place in the whole quran without quoting the contextual elements for example just i am ending it for example when quran says waqatilu aimat al kufr two things they it is trans the word kufr is translated as disbelief fight against the leaders of disbelief no the manifest quran says if they break their pledges after having made their treaty and openly revile your religion causing a potential threat to state security then fight the leaders of militancy manifest quran does not translate here at this place the world kufr as disbelief here the world kufr has not been used in its technical theological sense here the world kufr has been used in the sense of aggression invasion and indiscriminate killing of human kind that's why is this thing is militancy said the fight against the leaders of militancy then fight the leaders of militancy to preempt their aggression and invasion indeed they have no commitment to their pledges this preemptive action is needed so that they might stop their offensive designs so whatever is outside from the ambit of the world has been given in brackets parenthesis and whatever is include the meanings are chosen in the light of the context whether the verse context or the verses whether the context historical context that's why when any of the youth reads the manifest quran and there are dozens and hundreds of the verses which talk about the militants talk about the mushrikeen quraish of makka ghazawat badr and uhud but the verse does not tell of uhud and badr it is just a statement of almighty allah now mufassir mufassir this is the the the, the exegete the one who is doing an exegetical work exegetical specialist he explains the contexts 
not the translator so in translation all these problems still remain there that's why those people who just read the translation and have no proper profound knowledge of arabic language and tafsir and hadith and fiqh and tarikh and history they don't know they just read the verses they wrongly apply these things on the present day non muslim and whatever wherever they will the manifest quran will stop you everywhere it will protect you every year it will not allow you to get misled whatever you are reading manifest quran will teach you read this context in the context of this historical revolution in which the verse was revealed <laughs> because this verse was revealed in a specific context when the quraish of makka attacked on madina in spite of the fact that holy prophet had already migrated to madina and madina and holy prophet they were no more threat to quraish still they attacked on madina and ghazwa badr so holy quran is referring aimatul kuf the leader of militancy to those quraish leaders who attacked madina without any threat and the second when the treaty of hudaybiyah was done and there was a 10 year pact of no war no war pact was agreed upon so there were some allies of the state of madina or some tribes were allies of the state of makka and it was decided in that agreement of hudaybiyah that makka will not attack on madina as well as on the allies of madina and madina will neither attack on meccans nor the allies of meccans it was decided as a article but the meccan quraish attacked on banu bakr banu bakr and uh, attacked on banu khuza'a uh, uh, banu khuza'a they were allies of the madina holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they helped banu bakr who were allies of the meccan disbelieving quraish so in, and they killed 20 innocent people so these verses were revealed in this particular historical context and almighty allah gave those brutal killers the title aimatul kufr these are leaders of militancy so translator does not take pain to explain this historical background or contextual background he will just translate the words any reader may take it any meaning whatever he want and he can miss apply wherever he wants to apply so that manifest quran one of its hundreds uniqueness uh, messages and uh, unique characteristics is that wherever is such a place where a risk is involved it will always hold your hand and it will protect your mind to go on right or wrong side <laughs> So <laughs> I told you not many things, but I finish it here. So it has dispelled misconceptions. The manifest Quran. It has given theological clarities, theological clarities. Wherever the rank of holy prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم is comes, rank of holy prophet, manifest Quran always keeps and protects your faith and aqida. Like wa wajda ka dal lan fahda. Let us finish our two days meet uh, conference and speech on this subject. Wa wajda ka dal lan fahda. So every translation you will see that he found you misguided. He found you on wrong path. He found you on this and that, and he guided you towards right path. You will find this. But the the manifest Quran says. Alam yajid kahi did he not find you an orphan and sheltered you with a graceful position? He found you lost in his love and guided you to your destination. He found you in need of his support and enriched you with his abundant favors. So wherever the matter of akida comes, the, this translation always protects you and. legal implications are resolved through this translation scientific accuracy is available everywhere in the translation and there are many many other aspects inshallah you will find when you recite it regularly so the my last message and hope is that i th- i i wish that every single person should have his own copy not only one copy for the whole family every single person
has its own copy or every single person among the parents and children brothers sisters sons and daughters then your relatives your they should recite it every day whatever time you can spare recite it every day try to understand it and try to uh, to enjoy the beauty of allah's message and allah's words then apply in your life convey it to others and take this read yourself give gift to your neighbors to other people muslim the non muslim get connected with the quran connected with the attribute of almighty allah and get the light of div divinity divine light in your hearts and mind through the manifest quran <laughs> almighty allah may always keep you on right path and may he always keep you steadfast Allah Taala always keep you highly, greatly, profoundly connected, strictly connected with the Quran, and He may enable you to get the light of the guidance of the Quran, which Almighty Allah has sent. Allah Taala Karim for my sir. Wa ma alayna illa al-balagh. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Mashallah. Stand and round of applause for Azizul Sayyid Sheikh Islam. This is a single authored work of Azul Sayyid Sheikh Al Islam. What to say about the 1,000 other works that Azul Sayyid Sheikh Al Islam has completed? And today we have a special sale. So each copy of the Manifest Quran can be bought from downstairs for £20 a copy. This is a special sale just for the launch day. So a huge request for everybody to buy copies for each one of their family members and their friends. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Maghrib Salah can be prayed downstairs in the Wonderland. Namaz, go for Salatul Maghrib downstairs. Thank you. I will pray here in the back room as I pray Salatul Asr. Everybody can be escorted by the volunteers downstairs to pray Salat al Maghrib. There's okay. a space in the foyer there as well, and all the stalls for the Quran are there as well. Again, my salams to you. Assalamu alaikum. My supplications and my salams to you, and my love to you always. Allah Almighty Allah may always keep you protected from every kind of evil. Assalamu alaikum. And He may always.